Hey guys, how's it going? Good, how are you, Mark? Good, Michael, can we, uh, you have audio? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Cool. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, so today is pretty exciting. Um, we're gonna record what is likely gonna be a longish and fairly in-depth look at some new uh, code and capabilities of the network that are actually being released uh, in the next couple of days. So on the date that we're recording this, uh, things are not, well, they're released, the code is out there, but we have not made the announcement yet. Um, but today we're gonna talk about uh, the Helium console and the Helium router. So the two components that sort of form what is uh, the sort of routing backbone and the user interface for the Helium network. Um, I've got with me uh, Lewis Cherry from Helium, uh, who's part of our developer engineering team and has done a lot of the work to help with the open sourcing of these components. And uh, Michael Falkvid, whose name I probably butchered, uh, who's part of a company called Triet out of um, Stockholm. Uh, who has been doing some fantastic work growing the Helium network coverage across the Nordics and is about to um, get into sort of running infrastructure for devices and sensors. And so uh, Michael has kindly agreed to be our guinea pig uh, for sort of deploying this infrastructure uh, out of the gate. Um, do you guys wanna give a quick introduction on both your backgrounds? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, as Mark mentioned, I'm on the development engineering team. Um, I help people use all the different pieces of the Helium stack from running miners, running validators to running network servers today. So I basically help with all the technical integration with anybody who wants to do something with our like open ecosystem here. All right, I'm uh, Michael. I have a background at Ericsson and Accenture, uh, but three and a half years ago, I quit my job and decided to work full time as an IoT consultant because I thought it was a uh, fun and uh, uh, ever changing space. And that's where I like to be. So I started using LoRaWAN and Sigfox right away, uh, but my customer journey has also given me experience with wireless MBUS and narrowband IoT, which are other uh, radio access technologies that are commonly used. Fascinating. Uh, um, so how long have you been in LoRaWAN specifically? How long have you used LoRaWAN specifically? I built my first LoRaWAN node almost exactly four years ago. Nice. Uh, Things were a lot harder I, then. <laughs> Than they are now. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I had to go to the fifth floor and lean against a window to get coverage. <laughs> uh, that's not uh, something I need to do now when I can run my own gateways. Yeah. Uh, and we'll get into that a little bit as we do this conversation. I want to make sure we have enough time for the technical pieces. But uh, you know, the coverage that you and the Triad team, actually, the entire sort of Stockholm um, community is building is pretty remarkable. Um, I'm not, have we done much mapping out in Stockholm? I haven't seen the map lately. Um, but the coverage based on, you know, the sort of gateways and hotspots that you're deploying and the antennas and the actual positioning is, is remarkable. So kudos to you. Um, all right. So I'm sharing my screen. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to sort of, um, highlight what we're going to talk about here in terms of code and documentation. So the two primary chunks of code we're going to look at today are, um, uh, console. So it's up here on github, github.com slash helium slash console, uh, which is described as a, a LoRaWAN headless management console for the Helium blockchain network. Uh, and we have this other repo over here called, oh, is this the old one? Okay. So Helium router. So uh, this is a bit of a, an omnibus piece of code, which combines the, the network server piece uh, with an API for console, that repo that I just showed you. Um, and provide sort of interface to the Helium blockchain. So you know, people on watching this are probably pretty familiar with Helium, but if you're not, the thing that really sets us apart from your standard sort of LoRaWAN network uh, and LoRaWAN network server is, is the usage of the Helium blockchain and how we use it to sort of distribute and decentralize um, the, the coverage, uh, which at this point is the largest uh, LoRaWAN network in the world. So, okay, so at this point, um, oh, one last thing I'll show before we get into it. Um, and Louis, I think at some point we can just transition into um, uh, building this out if you want to. But uh, we've got some documentation up here too. So if you go to docs.helium.com, uh, we're mainly going to be focusing on the run and network server component of this. So we'll be walking through buying an OUI and deploying console. Uh, and you know, we'll get into all these concepts, but OUI stands for an organizationally unique identifier. Um, and you know, the idea here is that you can um, you know, 
we'll, we'll let Lewis and, and Michael talk about it. Also be running console, which again is documented here. Um, and I think I'm missing at least one other piece of documentation though, which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, but this is the sort of the bulk of it for today's exercise. Um, so we're gonna jump into actually deploying console, buying an OUI, using this. Um, Michael, can you talk for maybe 30 seconds to a minute about why this is of interest to Triat and why you guys are considering you know, operating your own um, essentially private network server on the Helium public network? Yeah, sure. Uh, so our experience after working a few years with the customer project is that they don't really care about messing with the network stuff. They want the data. Uh, and a very common question, I guess, is that, can we get the data into Azure? Then after that, we can handle it or whatever cloud platform they prefer, or if they run everything in-house, that's where they want it. But they that's the handoff point. Anything that happens before that, they would prefer to not mess with. Uh, so that's an opportunity for us. We can handle that. I think it's a lot of fun to do it, uh, yeah. and we can make money. Uh, it's a it's a perfect match. Nice. I think it makes perfect sense. I mean, uh, there are a handful of it, we we envision that this would be used by bigger organizations who wanted to own you know more of the infrastructure. Um, so you know, uh, it's it's quite early with this, but there's a handful of larger uh, and more sort of sophisticated organizations like yours that are already sort of looking at this. Um, Lewis, you want to touch really quickly on uh, like uh, just generally an LNS, um, yeah. so people are educated on that. <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to touch on that, and then also how it's the LoRaWAN difference on Helium. But um, yeah, first of all, like the reason, what is the LNS, and how does it relate to what other people are probably used to with the Helium blockchain? Um, I think is an interesting question. Um, basically, uh, the LoRaWAN network server is the is the entity that's more or less purchasing packets from Helium hotspots. So when a hotspot sees a packet, it reaches out to the appropriate network server and says, hey, I think I have a packet from your devices. They kind of do a back and forth. It decides to buy it. And then the packet is handed off. Um, so that's that's coming at it from like the Helium perspective. Um, LoRaWAN was not really designed for, um, or its architecture doesn't immediately lend itself to what we're doing on the Helium blockchain, but we've managed to kind of squeeze, to, to adapt it to to, um, to work with precisely what we're doing. And the way we've done that is basically by, um, <clears throat> it, well, it's two ways. Uh, well, the OUI entity is the organizational unique identifier, which is something that you register on the Helium blockchain. Um, and that basically lets the hotspots know that you exist as a LoRaWAN network server. Um, and as an OUI, you start managing things called filters and slabs. Um, so the filters are important because the join requests um, are uh, basically join requests have this app EUI and dev EUI, which from basically is a unique identifier for a device. Um, those filters get written into the blockchain so that when a hotspot receives a join request, it looks at the block it looks at the blockchain, looks at all the filters for all of the OUIs. And it's, it, it asks those filters, do you know about this app EUI, dev EUI, or this unique identifier for the device? And based on that, it'll offer that packet and, and make the transaction. That's for the join frame. Um, the LoRaWAN uh, has two, spec has two frames, the join frames and the data frames. After the join frame, you get assigned a device address. Um, and that's where the slabs come into account. When you register an OUI with the blockchain, you, you buy a, a slab, which is like an address space, and you can, if you're used to like IP stuff, you can think about it as like an IP range. Um, so it's basically an address range that uh, relates to your OUI so that when gateways or hotspots receive those packets, they know that this is one of your devices who has accomplished a join request with you. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, at the high level from, uh, from the LoRaWAN spec, how things come together. Um, and what we're doing with Michael today is uh, buying an OUI um, and then setting up the actual software that handles those transactions. Exciting. And he's going to be the first person to, to sort of do it uh, outside yeah. of Helium, which is going to be and pretty We're doing cool. it live. Um, yeah, nothing, absolutely nothing will go wrong. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> except, except the blog post that I'm trying to load. Uh, here we are. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a, a great post, I want to make sure I didn't forget about this, that Lewis wrote uh, at the end of last year that basically sort of hinted at, at this work that we're doing, you know, open sourcing console and router and giving people the ability to run their own infrastructure on, um, on this public Helium network, uh, which is 
like an incredibly powerful concept. So um, we'll put this somewhere in the notes, but certainly uh, you should check out this post from Lewis. All right, so let's get into it. Yeah, should we do it? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. All right, Lewis, I'll let you take over. The, uh... um, I think we're just gonna get our hands dirty now. Um, so the the docs, we're, we're, we are stepping a little bit off from the docs today to make things go a little bit faster. Um, so what we're going to do with, uh, with Michael is first set up the software. Um, so it starts with, uh, actually, um, I guess it's, pro if you can do a screen share, Michael, um, I, I don't know where you're at it with it, but, um, basically this starts with cloning down, um, the console repo, um, and, uh, doing a Docker, um, compose command, um, if, if all the dependencies are installed and everything like that, it's it's super quick. Um, <clears throat> and I think there's been a little bit of prep work on Michael's side to do that. Yes, there there has there are some errors, but I'm not sure if they are due to my setup or if it's because these are it's all early days with the console. Uh, all right, so um, yeah, one of the first steps is uh, creating your um, environment files. Uh, so we have these templates that you copy over to kind of start your, uh, your, um, your configured environment. And that's what Michael's doing right now. Yeah, uh, let me make that one bigger as well. So first we copy the template. Then of course, everybody's free to use their own favorite editor. Uh, I started using, using computers when there was nothing else, so I had to use them, so that's what I use. All right, uh, so first we need to generate some keys. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm actually going to steal this command and put it in the docs because I like it better, or uh, I don't think we actually have a, this explicitly in the docs at the moment. Uh, let's see. Uh, I was pretty sure that's what I used. Oh, you sent uh, it to me earlier. What was it? Yeah. Do you want to check it? Rand. I think it's just, just open. Uh, it's just rand, and, not random. All right. So there, oh. and then we want no wrapping. Whoa, that was a bit strange. Uh, maybe we can't do that here. All right, uh, so it wraps, so we'll have to just fix that. Uh, so we have the first key like this. And then, a s what is this? <laughs> Which one? There's, there's something that's uh, popping up. Uh, maybe it's not shown on the on the screen share, but it's, nope. it's a window, a login window. Uh, ah. <laughs> so there we have another one. You lost your padding, the equals. Actually, you lost the equals on the first one too. Yeah, you're right. Thanks. There we go. And then a third key. And so to, to be perfectly honest, I don't know what every single one of these keys do. But um, like I do know, for example, router secrets in particular, we're going to be copying that one into the router environment because the, the general architecture um, actually, before we do the Docker Compose, I'll, I'll show you what well, we should take a look at that. But this this is a th there's basically three Docker containers that are all going to be working together to um, to make the system work. Um, and these, in some cases, are keys for the Docker's to Docker containers to talk to each other. And then um, in some cases, they're keys for external services like uh, like the Auth0 stuff that we'll get to in a second. Yeah. So what confused me a bit here was a Unix timestamp. Well, I know what that is, but there are pretty many. Yeah, um, that's a good point. Um, so we, we'll need to add that to the docs, but basically just take a timestamp for now um, of, of what the time is at when, like when you create the key, for example. Yeah, 
uh, all right. The OUI number is something we'll add later. Yeah, uh, we'll go ahead and put this in. Um, because we're doing the, the flow a little bit out of order, uh, this is in the instructions when you're buying the OUI. But basically, if you go to, um, I just sent yeah, you the so link. So if we had bought the OUI, we would have known the number. Right. And it is going to be five. Um, when you're buying the OUI, there's a link that we can check out to confirm that. So the OUIs are, um, like as we mentioned, the organizational unique identifier is basically how um, anyone who wants to run an LNS and have it have the blockchain know about it. This is how this is where you start. Um, so you uh, you purchase an OUI, which cost a hundred data uh, dollars worth of data credits, and um, and these just increment one by one by one. So Michael's actually buying the the fifth OUI. Um, and pretty much all the OUIs up until now have been purchased by Helium. So he'll be the first. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and what's, what's I guess, conceptually worth um, thinking about, and it's talked about in that article that, that Mark is, uh, the blog post that Mark linked a second ago. <clears throat> but basically, the OUIs, um, or this mechanism is what makes this whole system permissionless. And that's what's really neat about it from a infrastructure standpoint, because we have uh, tens of thousands of gateways throughout the world providing public infrastructure, but you can come in and uh, nobody can stop you from uh, connecting a device to the Helium network and from you managing your own data. So that's what's really um, conceptually really neat about this. And um, that's what makes our LoRaWAN network um, unlike any other, basically. <clears throat> you know, you can't, Helium can't stop you from doing this essentially. And no one, no, no one can really. <clears throat> so, um, here we're uh, this would change if you're in production, but it's just going to be local host. And was it 4,000 here? Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to double check on the docs right now, but I think you're right. Uh, I memory. think it was. Uh, yeah, 4,000. And then uh, auth zero. Yeah, so did you uh, set up your Auth0 account already? Yes, I did. Cool. And uh, what is Auth0, Lewis? Oh, good good question. <laughs> uh, so Auth0 is the um, what we're going to use for logging in and for identity management on console. Um, so uh, it's when you're running it locally, maybe not as much a big deal. But what's really nice is um, because of the Auth0 integration, you could easily start using this in production on a, on a public server and, and uh, um, use Auth0 to, for, your, uh, for your user's um, identity management. So it makes like one click login with Google super easily, easy and stuff like that. Uh, so the domain, what I understood is just this. Uh, it's the same as it says here. Uh, yep. That looks right. Yeah, and this got me a bit confused. If it's always HTTPS and the base URL, yeah, why why is it even a parameter? But well, I, I don't that's know. That's how it honest. works. That's how it is right now. It's yeah. a good question though, and and uh, All right, you could uh, you could file an us... issue on the console and be like, hey guys. Yeah, why do I need to do things twice? Yeah, and the mail we ignore for now. That's right. Uh, I guess those are for like notifications and things. Exactly. Like for example, there's um, there's a, so just to uh, also provide some context, like console is literally a like a product that Helium has in production right now. So you're getting a lot of features here um, in this project. Uh, Mailgun, for example, is <clears throat> the email alerts to let people know that their balances are low. Or um, and there's a whole bunch of other notifications that um, that organizations can receive. Um, so uh, um, yeah. Anyway, that's what Mailgun is. Um, we're gonna skip that now because we're just trying to get the uh, the basic idea running. Um, so and before then we're happy we leave with this, this config. All right. yeah. Just let's just make sure we copy the router secrets into your um, uh, into your buffer. Take the whole yeah. thing with the, with the yeah. Unix uh, with the timestamp. I mean. It's with okay, yeah. Uh, I believe so. We'll double check, but it's not entirely clear from the uh, docs. So maybe we'll okay. update them. Yeah. All right. So we're done, and then 
we had n router template. Mm -hmm. So here we have. So I, the only really important thing here is the um, <clears throat> the uh, yeah what you pasted, which is the secret key. Um, and actually, yeah, now that you've mentioned it, maybe I was wrong about the uh, the timestamp prefix. But you're right; it's not clear. Well, yeah, I, I would guess that it's just the key and not the timestamp based on the info here. Uh, yeah. But... Well, I, I think the mis the info is probably misleading because I think uh, let me All look right, at my so... local configuration. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely want the timestamp. All right. So, so that's timestamp. all we mess with right now. Yeah, you're gonna want to update that OUI again as well. Yeah. Set it to five. Um, and one more thing. Uh, I we're gonna try to not change that for now, but you see the uh, I want to explain the router default dev adder. Um, so that is in the case that uh, the um, console is unable or uh, technically router is the one that assigns the dev adders because it is it is uh, it holds much of the LoRaWAN logic um, when it doesn't know the geography of a uh, of the device, it'll give it this default device address. Um, you, you'll you want to make sure that this is within one of your slabs. We talked about this earlier, the uh, OUIs have slabs. This is probably not in your slab, but I don't think it's going to be an issue when we get started. And yeah, actually, there. thanks for doing that. Um, so the, uh, well, I guess the, um, this, this makes it look more like a, what, how people represent the, uh, the, Dev, dev adder and those, um, I believe it starts at the 04, uh, 0400, 4800, I believe is 48 the- 48 is the H in Helium, Yeah, right? and that's the network network ID. So that never changes. And then what does change is the 4800, which will be the default address that's given to the um, to a device when you don't know what region it's coming from. Um, this is kind of a more complicated uh, notion, but some, because the device addresses are kind of expensive, um, they're hundred dollars each. It um, it is it's useful to to start multiplexing and adding lots of devices on a single address, and we have a lot of this logic in router that does this for you. So like theoretically, even though you buy a slab of only eight devices, you can you can run about sixty four devices on there without worrying about it. Um, and so you can make more use of a smaller um, device address space. Um, and so it just lets you conserve addresses more easily. Uh, and in case you're wondering how that works, basically the it's able to brute force the, um, the message integrity check to, to verify which device um, of the four, let's say, that are on the same address did this packet actually come from. Um, so anyway. Uh, we'll leave that for now because I don't think it's going to be a problem, but uh, we'll, we, you would want to tune this later. Um, and then the rest of it, we can kind of just leave as is. Okay, I think we're good. All right. So now we'll want to go to the next step. Um, I'll bring up the docs again. And I think um, Mark Mark had some connectivity issues, so we lost him for a little bit. Hey guys, uh, this is Dell. I'm the um, I'm the product manager at Helium. So. I'll, uh, I'll be taking over from Mark while he figures out his, his issues. Uh, but thanks for, uh, thanks for watching. And we're excited about this. This is a big milestone for Helium. I want to make it very clear that, you know, this process of purchasing an OUI or, or dev adder, I think Lewis mentioned it before, but just to clarify or make it emphasize the point, you don't need Helium at all in this process. Right. This is um, this is something that you can go and take care of, and, and there's no um, there's no interaction needed with Helium to, to do this and, and spin it up by yourself. Um, anyway, sorry. Back to you. Liz. Yeah, Dal. I think that's a really good point. Uh, I 
I'm the guinea pig, so I get some hand holding here by Lewis. But except for that, uh, once we've gotten the docs uh, up to date uh, with every all the small things, uh, then anybody could do this on their own, and there's no need to talk to anyone at Helium about this. You could talk to Helium because they're nice guys, but you don't need to talk about this. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Appreciate it. And we welcome talking to our, to our partners for sure. But uh, yeah, we're we're um, we're very impressed with our, our partner community and and how how engaged they are and how much feedback they provide and and we want to keep that going. So thanks for that, Michael. So I think in the flow here, we're should we show these settings? uh let's see no these the oh uh, yeah the we still want to do URLs. that i think we forgot yeah, to do that i've already the... done that on my application oh, yeah uh, but i'll just show you need to enter them here mm -hmm. and here and here and for a production environment then of course you would use your public host uh, and probably uh, other uh, port like you would probably use uh, uh, https and no port something yep and one thing that's a bit tricky is that once you've entered all this you need to scroll way down here and click save changes i missed that and then nothing works <laughs> yeah thank you for uh, that's that's a very very helpful i think yeah all right so that means we're done we already covered uh, the uh, Router environment. That was pretty easy. And then there was a small change here. Yeah. Yeah. Again, just another host name update. Yeah. Maybe a small nitpick here. I'm not sure if we should use the uh, leading slash. Yeah, I think that's uh, <clears throat> that's fair. So okay. So that's done. Um, yeah. So I think uh, it looks like in the tutorial we're on the run it phase, yeah. and if we did everything right, the login. Well, let's let it build, because <laughs> that's where your error was uh, when we started, right? Yeah, there oh. were some things uh, already up. OK, so yeah, just one thing. I think I mentioned it, but basically the um, we're going to see Helium router crash a couple times. Um, and that's because it's trying to connect to console, which um, might take a minute to come up. Um, and and so just, to give some, just, just to give some clarity around some of the terminology. So overall, we, we refer to this as Helium console. Um, and, and console is basically composed of, of two main components, the front end and the back end. And the back end component is what we refer to as router. Um, and so this is what Lewis is, is describing. Uh, so I just want to make sure that that's Yeah, actually, <clears throat> let's, let's close this for a second just to, because I guess I, I like to think of it from the, the code perspective. Could you? Uh, get out of this real quick, Michael. Just do a control C, it'll shut down the whole system. Yeah, sure. So we can try to boot it up in a second and look at these errors. But yeah, the um as as Zhao was mentioning, like this well, and you can see so look, let's look at the Docker compose. I think that's useful to look at that configuration file to understand the architecture of, of how everything works together. But um <clears throat> can you cat the uh the file or something? Or or you can VI it or whatever. Which the uh I think it's Docker compose.yaml uh, yeah, uh, or docker uh, yeah there we go do we i so we get some so when you call highlighting. docker compose up it basically um, it's putting up these three services that are defined in um, <clears throat> in this docker compose and um, I, I would nuance it slightly differently and explain that like basically helium router is doing all of the blockchain stuff and all of the network server stuff. Um, console for the most part is the front end and doing a lot of the business logic of like managing devices um, and managing the Postgres. And um, 
so basically the the router will connect to console to know about device definitions and things like that and then it'll it'll interact with uh with hotspots on the blockchain and um and we'll also do the uh the lower wan stuff like assigning a dev adder and um <clears throat> decrypting the packets um things like that it also actually does the um the application integrations so um we'll we'll see that in the dashboard later but when you do an HTTP integration, um, router just does it all kind of all on its own of receiving the packet, decrypting it, and then handing it off to the HTTP endpoint that you might have configured. Um, anyway, so that's one piece of context there. And then let's uh, let's look at this issue that we were having in the Docker Compose now. I want to see why you're crashing still. Uh, this looks suspicious. Yeah, it looks like um, you're not API connecting still. something because. Yeah. That is not going to resolve. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so we probably want to update the template here. Yeah. Uh, Looks like we just want to put the L in localhost. Yeah. Uh, and I'll change my Wait. local. Uh, so that means the template. Oh, yeah. That's my fault in the template an then. Yeah. yeah. So you just make a note that you'll update that later. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you. <laughs> I wonder how many sysadmins has uh, hour has been spent to to find things like this. Couldn't we use something shorter? Yeah. Well, All right. You could do so, one, one, two, seven. Yeah, I'll Let's just try that again. Uh, try running it again. I think the 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 router crashed right after the console messages, and I mixed up the two. Yeah. So I think I just wasn't patient enough. Uh, so did you kill this, it? No, this is live. This is the latest. It's very quiet. Uh, all right, let's try to hit your local host then, maybe. Yeah. Uh, Lewis, what what stage are we at here? Um, we are. Wait, we got another crash out of router. We're at the bottom of running, or we're basically trying to stand up the software now. We've done all the configuration normally, <clears throat> and uh, um, we're just trying to get our first uh, get the login screen for console essentially. What needs to be changed for the template? Um, I wrote it down, but I, th I I'm pretty sure I'm the one that that changed console to local local host in the template here, and I think that's what was causing uh, Michael's startup to fail. All right, so I'll run Docker Compose up again. Yeah, let's see if that gets us through it. Yeah. Okay, I think we that did looks it. It's a bit better, right? Yeah. So I'll just refresh. Yeah, I'd hope that that will probably give you a landing page now. Yeah, OK. It's loading. Oh, maybe I spoke too soon. Could you uh, tr try to get rid of that? Um, let's see. Just reload and see if there's yeah. something. Mm -hmm. It okay. looks like Firefox doesn't like it, because when I refresh in Firefox, it still doesn't work. Maybe Firefox doesn't like it when um, when there's any of those failures and, and Chrome seems to be more tolerant. I don't know. Yeah, I know uh, Firefox has become uh, very intolerant with uh, cross-site uh, domain and things like that. So maybe it's something, but that usually results in, uh, well, yeah, something like this. Mm -hmm. But, well, I don't think we need amplitude. I'm not sure no. what it is. No, but it's uh, it's something that hopefully we can stub out better uh, or make it so we can disable it in the configuration. Yeah, so but, uh, let's just use Chrome for now. That's okay. fine. So since my user doesn't have an organization, I'm prompted to create one. That's the same as the public Helium console. So nothing new here. Yeah. And what's and like for context, what's nice to know about is 
because this is basically our product that we've open sourced, <clears throat> it's um, it's got a lot of features for managing organizations and it's not as simple as like managing just your devices and stuff like that. You can create lots of different organizations. You can um, you can let, like, I think what you guys uh, I try it are, are trying to do is, is let someone else come in onto your um, OUI and start running devices and you can help, you can manage their account and segregate it from the other accounts. So it's um, it's a pretty full featured product um, that can do a lot of cool stuff. Um, so we're gonna put this flow on pause for a second and we're gonna go buy the OUI. Um, but first let's uh, go to- So, um, so Lewis, do you wanna do just do a quick summary of what we've done up till now? Yeah. And then what we're, what are next steps? What are we? What are we going to do next? <clears throat> so we went through getting console, which includes router um, up and running basically. And so we were able to log in, we we're able to create an account. And, um, and we see from the logs on the left that router is running um, and connected to console. So um, that, that, that Docker compose system brought everything up. It's working nicely. You'll see lots of <clears throat> like these lib P2P errors on the left. Um, there are warnings. Um, they're nothing to be really concerned about. Um, lib P2P is pretty like um, what's the word for it? Chatty. It's it's chatty and it's just it's it's like a bunch of people trying to connect to each other because the peer to peer network. So um, failing to connect to someone isn't some end of the world situation. It's just what happens because because it's uh, it's just how it goes. So um, see, seeing these these failures to dial, um, I think it's actually trying to hit the seed nodes. And the seed nodes, um, it's basically, uh, you, you, you might have seen them in the um, environment files, but that's kind of how you start learning about a peer-to-peer -peer network. So um, because this everybody's always hitting the seed nodes, sometimes they become overwhelmed. And that's why we have like five of them. And um, but in this case, this one that's 3, 4, 208, 255, 251, um, appears to be quite overloaded, and um, and so we're not have, we're not able to connect to it. But there's there's lots of seed nodes, and so we're getting information about the peer to peer network through the other seed nodes that we are able to dial. So um, we're actually going to interact with the router a little bit right now. Um, or actually, uh, before we do that, let's let me make sure that we covered everything. Um, yeah. So you get you get to this point, uh, you're able to log into console. Uh, so what are, what, what's the next step now? What? Yeah. So now we're going to actually purchase the OUI and um, and let the blockchain know that we exist, essentially. Um, before we do that, we're going to want to get the peer-to-peer -peer or the P2P address of router, because that's going to be important when we're um, actually buying the OUI. So uh, Michael, if you can open up another, um, uh, another Bash shell we're going to do a couple of commands to interact with router and um, and uh, get some information from it, basically. Also, it's very cool that you're doing this all uh, Windows on Linux, or Linux on Windows. Uh, yeah, I think Windows is a great window manager. Uh, but for everything else, I, I want good terminals. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So, so we want to go to the OUI lab machine. Oh, you're actually doing right. this on another server. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's do. Um, we're going to interact with router, and um, router is inside of a container. So you can do Docker exec. Um, and then it's helium underscore router, which is what you're seeing in the logs here on the left. And uh, let's just start with, uh, and then, um, so now this is like the prefix to put you inside of the container when you're doing these commands. Um, so now we're actually gonna call router by saying router. Um, and then there's starts, and then there's all the other commands we might use. So um, we'll start with, uh, let's start with info height actually. So this this is perfectly normal when you've just stood up router for the first time. Um, what this means is that block one, um, or the first block of the entire blockchain, because uh, inside the container that Michael set up, it only has the Genesis block, and now it's trying to get enough information about the network to um, to download a snapshot, and that is also something that's that's written into the container. Um, so we're not going to concern ourselves too much with that right now. 
Um, actually, if we go back to the tutorial, this might very much be in the flow, I think, is loading a snapshot. So maybe we will actually um, load the snapshot now and get this guy updated. Uh, yeah. yeah. So here we are. So just a bit of context. Um, I've been talking about blocks and snapshots. What The snapshots are a feature on the blockchain where you can pretty much sync someone up to a, um, a block height that's very far in the future. So like, I think during this recording, the Helium blockchain is probably at block 740,000. So, and we're at block one. Um, and so it would take a long time to sync every single block one by one. So these snapshots exist uh, basically um, to, to help catch you up without giving you all of the blocks along the way. Um, so you have to be careful. And so they summarize the current state of the blockchain. Um, the most important thing is the ledger. So they tell you, and the ledger is, is every single account balance. So you get the ledger and then you get a little bit of history, um, like the last 200 blocks. Um, and that's enough for you to kind of, to keep validating stuff from that point in time. Um, so the important thing though, when you're thinking about snapshots is like, who are you taking this snapshot from? Um, because they could pretty much uh, like you have to trust the source of that snapshot. Um, and so there's two ways that we manage this. Um, I think with Michael today, we're gonna do the, what I call the, um, actually, if you click here, I, I, uh, there's a different part of the docs that talks more about snapshots. Um, so there's, uh, there's what I call chain-based and then manual snapshot mechanisms. Um, the manual one, I think, is easier to understand. But basically, uh, Michael, I think you have a, a, a miner running somewhere that's fully synced up. So he can actually tell it, like, hey, give me a snapshot. And he can move that file from his miner, give it to router, and tell router, load this snapshot. Um, and that's great if you have, um, if it's easy to move that file around. And um, and if you're absorbing, basically, it's a snapshot that you trust because you trust the miner that you're operating. Um, and so that's a safe thing to do. Um, the another way of yeah, doing it. Is, sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Louis, but can that be done uh, with a miner that's not on the chain that doesn't have an invite code, or does it need to to be joined? Uh, it, it can be done on anybody. That, yeah, it, it can be um, a miner that's not asserted on the chain. Um, yeah. yeah, that's good. So it, then anybody it, could set it up. Uh, yeah. You don't. You don't need uh, uh, the invite codes. Yeah, and any and there's lots of things actually that uh, like we actually have like four different um, applications that Helium has open sourced that does fundamentally the same thing. Um, which and and the core thing that these guys are doing is keeping up with the blockchain. So they're they're connecting to the P2P network. They're syncing down blocks and they're keeping a copy of the. They're running a full node, is what many blockchains call it. Um, so the miner does that and that's what runs on every single hotspot today. Um, we just started validator on, on main nets. Those do the same thing. Um, blockchain ETL is the, the service that runs like a, a, a Postgres API for, for looking at blockchain data. Um, blockchain node is another app that we do that has, does exactly the same thing that follows the blockchain and keeps the local copy. Um, that, that product's useful because it does like JSON RPC stuff. Um, and I feel like we still have one more that I'm forgetting, but there's, there's a lot of things like for, depending on what you're doing, these are different tools that we have open sourced. Um, but you can load snapshots and take snapshots from all of them because, uh, at their core, they're running, I think something actually called blockchain core. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, yeah, just, just one clarification validators currently is running on testnet, not, not on mainnet. Yeah. That's right. So you don't want to pass snapshots from one net to another, but um, validators, when they go on the main net, they have the same snapshot ability. Yeah. So uh, in six months, we might not have miners running on gateways, hopefully. And at that point, um, if, you if you're if you running a validator, you could pull the snapshot from the validator and put it into your, um, your Helium router that you're standing up in, in July or something. Um, uh, okay, so the other way of doing snapshots is um, is using um, these blessed snapshots. Um, the way they work is I think every 720 blocks, the, the blockchain uh, decides to um, 
basically reg like the a blockchain transaction is made that um, puts like a fingerprint of a snapshot into that block. And so um, if you go to a synced miner and you do miner snapshot list, like this command shows, it'll give you the list of all the snapshots it knows about because at, at height 731521, um, a snapshot was done and we know that the hash of the snapshot is that. And then at that point, you can reach out over everyone on libp2p and you can ask them for a snapshot. And when they when you download it from them, you can see that the mat, the hash matches what was in that block and you are safe to use it. So this is useful if you like, if you can't move that file around, um, you can instead put this into the configuration of, of a miner or of a, of a router, for example. And that's in that sys.config file that um, you can read more about in the documentation. But I just wanted to give you that context. Um, and just when you take Helium router, it actually has a snapshot in its sysconfig that's inside that Docker container. But that snapshot's from far away. And actually, Michael, if you run the Docker info height, we might see that it jumped to like block 680,000 by now. But um, uh, that will mean that basically the, the snapshot thing worked. Um, it looks like it's still, so actually let's, let's do this. Um, do router uh, peer book, peer space book dash S. Um, Cause let's make sure that we're finding peers. Cause that's kind of the next important step to, to getting a snapshot. And that's sad. We don't know about anyone. Um, so but it, might take uh, some, it might take some time. Yes. To... Yeah. Um, it takes like, uh, generally, I think a good rule of thumb is about a half hour. Um, I think what would be nice is uh, um, we could try to give you an address. Uh, so I think this is also just a, a nice thing to know about. Um, let me see if I can remember this. Um, yeah, OK. So I'm going to have you connect to one of my miners that I'm running at home. Um, so you're going to do uh, um, router space uh, connect. And then you didn't do a slash IP4. Um, and then uh, slash 135.180.144.138. And then slash TCP. And uh, I believe it's 1750 that I have that one running on. Uh, the port, or uh, wait, no, hold on. That's my uh, UDP port for the radio packets. Let me double check what, what port I'm on. Actually, let's just try 44158, because I, I, I'm sure I have, because uh, that's the default port for miner. Um, same with router. When you, when you put these guys, uh, when you connect them, you want to open up your firewall so that you can accept connections there, and that will uh, um, especially when you're running a router, um, and we mentioned this in the tutorial, um, you want to do that so that people can come in and um, connect directly to you, and it just makes everything a lot more efficient. Um, and inbound connections are super important if you're running a router. Uh, so if you do this, uh, hopefully you'll find me. Otherwise, I'll try to figure out. Uh, oh, sorry, router peer connect. So now if you look at your peer book, uh, you should see me. And there you go. Uh, what do we do from there? So now it's, we'll leave that going for a bit, but um, basically with a peer, you can start learning about other peers and hopefully in a, in a few minutes, he'll find a snapshot. Um, but uh, let's go back to um, the flow of loading the snapshot by hand. Um, do you have the... Uh, a miner running somewhere? I have. Uh, there is, I need to do a few jumps to get it since it's a production environment. Uh, but I can do that. Uh, I just need to stop my screen sharing for a while. Okay. You, you want to take a five minute break and, and get set up for that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've been so gonna... at this for, for one and a half little... hour already. Yeah. So, yeah. Everybody. Stretch your legs while I fix this. <laughs> okay. No worries. And Michael, thanks again for um, for taking the time and going through this with us. We really appreciate it. Okay.
Okay, so let us know what 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 are we doing here? What's what? So we're gonna manually Michael? load the snapshot. Um, actually, before we do that, let's check the, the the block height. Maybe you got the snapshot from the network because that'd be that'd be a cool thing to show. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So um, yeah, I think because you connected to my node, you were able to to get enough information and sync down a snapshot. Um, it would have happened eventually. It just sometimes it takes longer than a half hour. Sometimes it takes ten minutes. Um, it all depends. Um, and so the, and the snapshot has has avoided or prevented Michael from having to sync the whole blockchain and accelerate that whole process, right? Kind of. So um, what the snapshot that he just got was uh, um, was for the the blessed snapshot that's inside of the container that he downloaded. Which which we issue, so you can kind of more or less trust. But if you want to be really paranoid, you might not want to. Um, but yeah, so he he that's how he did it. The problem is he's still ten thousand blocks behind. Um, I think he just looked on Explorer seven forty five. Yeah, so sinking ten thousand blocks, like I think that'll happen over twenty four hours or something. Um, maybe forty eight even. It depends on how things go. But um, so we want to get going a little faster. So we're gonna take a snapshot from his. Sorry. Uh, from his node, from his miner, and then um, can you guys hear the dog? Sorry, she's complaining nope. a lot. Good. Okay, Fine. I know that you guys can't hear it. I, I won't mention it again. <laughs> um, anyway, so he's gonna take a snapshot from a miner that he manages and um, just insert it immediately, which will sync him up within a few blocks of uh, of the tip of the blockchain. Yeah. So I have the snapshot here, uh, but it's not inside the Docker. So you uh, you basically SCP'd it or you moved it from a from a miner and you have it maybe uh, is it just right here locally snap mf. Yeah, it's locally cool. now. Uh, and yeah, this was from uh, one of our miners, but it could have come from an ETL node if we had one. Yeah. Uh, or an validator in the future. So when you did Docker compose up, um, it started it created a data file in the console directory where a lot of your data lives. So if you can do like ls uh, console data. Um, let's look at what, or CD there is cool too. Um, let's do LS, go to, go to router now. Um, and this is basically the mount point for var data inside of the Docker container. So, um, Michael's moving the snapshot into the mount point, um, which I guess you gotta do with sudo because it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a privileged directory inside of the Docker. And this has always been weird for me. In the host system, it is also privileged. Great. So now, um, you can do Docker exec uh, router or Helium router, sorry. And then router. So now you're interacting with the router um, program. You want to do snapshot load. And um, so that directory in our host system, which was console data router, is slash var slash data. Um, inside of the Docker. And then you're going to want to put snap-mf. And that should do it. Um, and this command uh, is probably the command that I use that fails the most, but it's not a tragedy when it does fail. Because um, just a snapshot is a lot of, loading the snapshot can be a lot of work. And depending on how powerful your machine is, um, it, can, it can be kind of slow. And this command like times out and basically says says an error. But if that happens, um, don't don't worry too much. Um, go look at the logs of the of the either the miner or the router, and see what it's doing. Because often what it's doing is applying the snapshot. Um, in this case, it looks like it worked because uh, the OUI lab is a powerful machine. And um, so let's look at this the block height now. And he's so all seven four five six two one, and the explorer says six two four. So yeah, cool. So that's uh, let's go back to the tutorial. I think um, 
the next step is normally to uh, um, so we completed the other tab. Uh, all the all this. Yep. Yeah. Load snapshot OUI update. Okay. So um, we did something a little different today. Uh, we set up the software before buying the OUI. So now we're actually going to back up and buy the OUI. But basically, um, at any point in time, um, you can use the OUI update command to uh, change the address that is managing your OUI. So the router address can change. Um, that's useful because basically that router key is like a hot key that's on the blockchain or that's interacting with, with the blockchain. Um, you don't have to worry too much about losing it. Obviously, it's annoying to lose it, but it's it's not like a critical thing to protect. As long as the wallet that owns the OUI, which is what we're about to go use, as long as you protect that key, you should be able to kind of keep control of you will con keep control of your OUI and be able to update um, the the public address of your OUI, i.e., the P2P address of the router that's going to be representing you, um, representing your OUI. So. Uh, um, let's go ahead and buy the OUI now. So yep. uh, could you click on that um, buy, or actually you have the tab open, it looks like, um, you know, yep. the top left. Got it. So uh, I think we covered a lot of this already, but I don't think we talked about the pricing very much. Um, but basically the minimum entry point for operating an OUI is you need to buy the OUI address for $100 worth of DC. And you need to buy the smallest, at least the smallest slab or dev adder slab available. Um, and that's basically um, going to be um, 800 DCs, $800 worth of DCs for eight addresses. Um, you can buy any power of two. So you can buy 16, um, 32, 64, 1,024, whatever. Um, but you're going to be paying $100 per address. Um, this is something else, though. Uh, this is... Yeah, but uh, I need to convert, and this is the easiest way I've found. Oh, you found the built-in calculator. Yeah, so... <laughs> That's cool. And if you uh -huh. want to use the CLI tool, well, you have the... Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I, I think I've used this to get the exact uh, command line and I could just copy paste it, but maybe it's been updated. The first step to buying the OUI is creating enough data credits so that you can actually uh, purchase the OUI. So we're going to do the, the simplest OU or the cheapest OUI purchase of $900 worth of DCs. And, um, and I don't think Michael, your account uh, doesn't have any DCs, so um, that's that's what this is uh, going to be about. So, in this tutorial, I kind of go through the math and how you can figure out kind of like by hand um, how many data credit or um, how much HNT you have to burn to get your desired amount of data credits. Um, so this is the. Uh, this is kind of the do it by hand. Um, Michael actually has a really cool, uh, since router is running, he has a kind of a hack to, to d make router do the math or uh, to make console do the math for you. Um, so let's go ahead and use that uh, to figure out how much HNT Michael needs to burn. Um, but but so... to make clear, but to be very clear, this is not, this interaction is not what you do in order to get data credits for the OUI. No, we're just, just using, we're using console as a calculator. That's right. Uh, because I, I have, the, you can read the tutorial to do things kind of by hand or more manually. But um, Michael has this kind of easy way of, uh, of doing it with console. We'll talk about this, how this works later when we're actually using console, but we're just going to use it to, to compute the numbers for us. So uh, we're- Yeah, I'm so kind of proud purge. about my new console, so I want to use it. Yeah, we, <laughs> that's why we set it up first. I like this flow, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can go ahead and yeah. Did not open so in the console, uh, my own since I have one and it's pretty cool. I can go to data credits, and I can just pretend I want to purchase them, and I say I need nine hundred dollars, and then I click I want to burn H and T to DC, and then I get a nice calculation here that this is how much I need to burn at the moment 
based on yeah. the Oracle price, but I didn't, I didn't need to calculate and I'm lazy. <laughs> yeah, so basically two, two, six, seven, eight, let's say um, we want to add a little bit extra because we need some, um, well, actually it depends if you're funding the wallet or not, uh, but it seems like you're just going to burn the DCs for yourself. Um, I think in the tutorial, I kind of like, it's also possible to have one wallet and burn some DCs for your fresh wallet or your other wallet who might be the, the wallet that you want to have own the OUI. But Michael, you're just going to, you're going to buy the OUI with your, uh, with your mining wallet, basically. Yeah. So um, uh, you can pretty much keep uh, things simple. Yeah. So you can burn almost precisely that amount. I'd round it up just a little bit, just so uh, in case the Oracle price changes or whatever. Um, yeah. So let's do 2067 or 2068, for example. Um, and uh, just remember that number, I guess, and uh, start interacting with your wallet. Yeah. So I have my wallet here uh, and then. Um, yeah, so the transaction is uh, rather than a pay, we're gonna do a burn transaction. So go ahead and write burn and then let's do dash dash help. Um, and then we'll just see what the rest of the parameters are. Um, so we want to do the amount and the payee. Uh, so the amount is the one we just uh, used console to calculate for us. Uh, and the payee is going to be yourself. So um, I don't know where we have your address available. Your your own wallet address. Do you have it pasted somewhere? Well, um, go ahead and press enter, and then that way we'll keep that command in the buffer. But let's just do a, we'll do the info command to get, get it from yourself. Cool. So that 13 WW is you. Uh, you can set that as the payee. And uh, the memo, we're going to leave blank because um, we don't really need it today. But um, what you were just seeing on console, for example, is uh, if you want to track it's just a way of tracking who made the payment or, or identifying them easily. Um, but you can actually just, you can omit the entire command or you want to do your own memo. Yeah, of course Let's we should. It. So like this. Yeah, and just so you know, um, I think you'll be fine on characters, but basically the memo is 64 bits at most. Um, yeah, I wanted to type try it rocks, but it won't fit. Not enough bits. Um, cool. So let's uh, let's do a dry run on this. If you don't do the dash dash commit at the end, it'll it'll do everything, including signing the transaction, but it won't submit it. So let's go ahead and do that just to to, to confirm the action. Yeah. Um, oh, and it didn't, it wasn't happy. Let's see. Burn. Oh, the help, the help is still hanging there. Yeah, it is. Well, if you ask for help, you get help. That's pretty neat. And then? Uh, yeah, then you just do your password. However, it is still not going to submit, even though you're typing your password. But it'll it should print it out, and you'll kind of get to look at it and confirm that it looks okay. Could not convert slice to array, which makes me think it probably doesn't like your memo. Yeah, uh, let's just check this command. That looks pretty okay. We could replace it just to make sure. No, I wanted to use this cool feature, but let's just skip it. It doesn't really matter. Oh, maybe it wants the padding for the entire uh, the entire size of 64 bits. Oh, so we need to, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five characters. Now we have eight. (laughs) 
What happened here? I don't think it did the full evaluate. Did we? What? Oh, something really. Oh, of course. Uh, double exclamation point runs the last command, right? Does it? I've never, I've never done that. Yeah. Okay, that's so fine. <laughs> if you do like ls and then double exclamation point, it runs oh. ls again. So you, to, so you got to escape it if you want it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And here you can see that it actually auto completed everything. That's exciting. That's uh yeah we're we're covering a lot of ground today. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need to be a Linux expert, uh, but it helps. <laughs> Uh, okay, so we'll do like this instead. All right. That looks good. Um, all right, let's fire it away. So I run the same command, but with dash dash commit. Cool. So uh, this is a blockchain transaction, and they can take a couple minutes. Um, I'm pretty impatient, so I usually track them in um, using the API uh, endpoint. So if you take that hash, uh, and I think I have the API endpoint in the docs there, if you want to bop back over to that. Let's see. Um, yeah, I'll walk you through yeah. the math. Yeah, that's the one. And so the so Michael has completed the transaction, and now we're just waiting for the data credits to show up in his account, correct? Yes. So uh, we're tracking. He submitted the transaction to our API. Our API submitted it to the blockchain, um, and it's uh, the status is pending. Um, and you can kind of see the summary of the transaction in this in this little JSON object. Um, the uh, this is really useful, and if it, like I don't, I I always hit this endpoint because I um, I sometimes do weird things and or I'm like developing something and I don't know whether like basically what's really nice is the failed reason will tell you precisely why your why your transaction failed if it fails. Um, like if you try to pay with more HNT than you have, it'll say um, invalid balance or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is really a, an easy way to kind of track stuff. Once you've submitted it using the um, the API or the uh, the, the CLI, um, it's really nice in the app, obviously, because you can kind of it, it tracks it for you. But uh, when you're doing CLI stuff, this is the way. Um, and you just hit refresh already, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, so it's still pending. And then, I mean, just because we have a bit of dead dead space right now, um, something I like to do. Uh, if I'm really impatient, is I go to Explorer and I look at the uh, the blocks being made almost. So if you if you uh, scroll down a bit on Explorer, you can um, you can see when the last block was. Um, and so uh, block six three five at seven twenty nine, and you go back to your your a the API endpoint. You can see precisely when you submitted it, and um, and you'd expect sometime after that to 31 so um yeah we're one hour we're a couple minutes behind oh. what's what's good to know is basically api this what's shown here is usually about a minute or two behind from the actual blockchain if you're really eager you can actually look at a miner and like see the blocks come through one by one and that's usually ahead of ahead of the api by like a minute but um uh, so if you hit like, but we see uh, here that currently oh, yeah. the block time is a bit high. That's very true. Uh, click view blocks. Actually, I haven't looked at that in a while. Um, Cause I, I, oh yeah, I like this view. So yeah, basically we can we can eagerly hit refresh here until uh, until we see our thing, until we see our block come yeah, through. Yeah, we have one from seven thirty now. Yeah, but it probably doesn't have our transaction yet. Cause what was it seven thirty one? 
Yeah. Yeah, I was. Yeah. So and it's still pending. And so this is why. No, I was just going to oh, say. I think my, I know where you're going to go with this. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dal. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so, Lewis, this is why we we did all that work up front to sync the blockchain so that uh, we could do this transaction. And it's we're just waiting for the next block to actually uh, have the transaction written to the block rather than um, needing to sync and get to this, this place. Right. So if, if they tried to do the transaction before well, and the blockchain hadn't been synced, then it wouldn't be successful. Uh, well, no, we, we synced the router for a different reason because um, it will be making transactions of its own soon. Um, but currently, we're actually submitting the transaction through the API and the API, uh, the Helium hosted API is usually always caught up. But um, you're you're right that the the router or the console and router will be wanting to make transactions soon and by syncing it up they're they're going to be ready to submit transactions themselves right. um but oh there's a block at 732 actually click the the height you might actually see your burn uh, usually there's not a lot of burns happening and um you mean here yeah and the uh the little pie chart if you look at the little guys on the right of the pie chart, you'll probably see that burn transaction. Oh, looks like you weren't included yet. So you can go back to the pending thing and confirm that it's pending, but likely, uh, oh, did you jump up a block? Yeah, 733, there you go. That's you. you have a token burn. So we could um, probably you should find, be able to find it. it. Boom. There? Yeah. And here we'll nice. probably see that it's no longer pending if I refresh. Uh, it's cleared. Cleared. Cool. And, and if uh, I run the info command, I should see that I now have DC, right? I think you got to do balance. Or yeah, maybe info. I don't know which one shows you. Let's see. We ran the info before. Uh, Oh yeah, you're right. Info. Uh, we we'll had do it. zero balance, and now we run it again, and now we have yeah a bit more than nine and however many zeros there are. Yeah, yeah. I think DCs are what ten to the negative five. Uh, so anyway, cool. So we are ready to do a second transaction, which is purchasing the OUI. So uh, let's go back to the tutorial. So I so that we don't mess it up, because I don't know if I'll remember it off the cuff. Uh, we've, um, we've done purchase the... Purchase the UI. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's let's look at this. Actually, let's just copy the whole thing, and then we'll, we'll look at it in your, uh, in your Bash shell. Yeah. Um, but um, so yeah, a note about the... Yeah. I have an old um, version of the wallet, so I need to. So that filter, I just want to note what that is, and because it's a big, scary uh, base64 piece of data. That is, um, we talked about filters a second, like it's it's part of the th um, like OUIs manage filters and slabs. Um, this is basically a dummy filter um, because the blockchain wants to see a filter. When it's when it's processing this transaction, um, so I've given you a dummy filter. Um, I actually don't know what's in it. It's probably it might be empty and or it might have, you know, a minimum uh, example. But uh, we're ace, actually gonna the A's sorry? are all zeros, I think. So there's yeah. a lot of big A, so that's zero. But there's some other stuff as well. Yeah. What basically what happens is like that 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 binary blob that we just wrote into the blockchain gets tries to get decoded as an XOR filter hash table. And if it can't be decoded properly, the blockchain will refuse it. So it's probably the minimum amount of information so that, uh, so that a um, XOR filter can be extracted. Or so it might, um, but I don't know what the encoding is and stuff like that. So we have a dummy filter. Um, we're gonna update that later with a real device. Um, but right now we're just buying the, the thing. Um, one last thing is you want to um, explicitly set the address 
to the P2P address of the router that we stood up. Um, and because you can you can leave that empty right now, uh, but you'd have to update it later. So, we, but we can do it all at once if we want to, essentially. Um, is it summary that gets me the peer-to-peer -peer address? I think so. A lot, a lot of commands do. Um, uh, I think peerbook s definitely does. All right. Um, but I don't think actually that that's the whole uh, address. No, there, there's some characters missing. Do to run. Yeah. There's another command that does. If you go to run console. Um, I think I have the shortest command that always, or actually it just might be um, info address maybe. I have it in the docs though. If you look at uh, the um, run a console, there's the uh, OUI update and the command. Oh, so I, I have the explicit path to the, if you scroll more to the right though, you'll find the, um, the interesting part, peer adder. Yeah, there, there it is. There. And you want to take everything after that slash, after the second slash, sorry. Right. And then um, as an option to this OUI create command, we'll do dash dash address. Um, by the way, did you mean to stop sharing screen? No, I did not. That's but but things started jumping around, so that's probably why. All right, uh, we're back. Uh, so what we did was that we didn't use your address here. Uh, no. No, this is just the create. That's the update. Command. So uh, we're doing something a flow that's like slightly different. Um, we put up console first, and then we're going to buy the OUI. And since we're buying the OUI, we can just set the address at that stage. But in yep. the flow in the tutorial, I kind of have you buy the OUI, you set up console, and then you update the OUI at the very end. Um, so we're just doing a slightly different flow, but works just as well. Um, yeah, and, and that's why I don't need to tell which OUI, because I will be assigned one, I guess. Right, you're doing, uh, yes, exactly. So you're just doing a different OUI command. You're doing, this is OUI update. We're doing OUI create. Indeed, it it actually checks with the API and says what OUI is next available. Um, let's do this and, and look at the look at the transaction before we commit it. That way we can um, make sure it looks all good. Okay, so you're buying OUI5, you're requesting a subnet of size eight, and that's your address of your router. So let's go ahead and commit that. Okay, so let's go ahead and also burn some DCs for your, uh, for your router because um, just to make this clear, like your wallet is one thing, it owns the OUI, but then in this OUI transaction, you're giving the router key um, the ability to manage your router for you. So uh, it's gonna be opening and closing state channels on your behalf. It's also gonna be allowed to update the filter, um, but currently your router uh, doesn't have any money basically. So we're gonna do um, another burn transaction. Um, this time let's do something like, uh, like five DCs will be about twenty dollars worth. Um, you could do even less if you wanted to. Um, oh, that's fine. But uh, yeah, so we'll just do another burn, basically, with the beneficiary being that P2P address that we just put up. I think it's dash dash amount and then dash dash. Uh, hmm. Who is it? Uh, I forget. What, yeah, let's do dash dash help actually, because I don't remember. <laughs> Payee. Hello, this is funding the router so that there's Precisely. 
data credits. Uh, um, okay. And then an organization would use those data credits. Yeah. So that, that fun calculator that, uh, that Michael was using earlier is um, a way for like users of console to actually burn DCs for router, but then have it tracked under their organization. So the, the, the transaction that that thing is generating um, is, is, yeah, it, it basically kind of um, lets them fund it and lets your our Postgres database, so like our off-chain database track who has been funding um, the router. So uh, yeah, that looks good. Um, we can kind of, we can verify it as well if we want to. Yeah, about uh, the DCs, uh, should we look into how I plan for how much DC I need? Uh, yeah. Is it only for the amount of messages I purchase or is it also for the state channels? Do they cost? Yes, so there's, um, I need to look at some of the transactions, but essentially, uh, like ballpark is um, you're going to pay about 30 cents, 30 to 60 cents to open and close state channels. And that happens every, um, it, it's configurable, it's in the settings. And I think we let the state channels exist for, uh, actually we should, we should look at the environment. Basically the end of router file has some stuff about like how long a state channel should exist for. And I think we set it to like 45 or something, 45 blocks. Um, so that means that like at, the, at block zero, let's say we open up a state channel, we're going to pay 35 cents for that transaction to process. And we're, then we're also going to fund it with some amount and the amount might be um, like $2. So um, it'll be $2 worth of DCs that we can spend in that channel buying um, packets. At the end of 45 blocks, before the end of 45 blocks, the router will close that state channel it'll pay for the size of that closed transaction. And that ends up being variable based on how much business has happened and how many people need to be paid and stuff like that. Um, but it'll be about another 30 to 60 cents basically. Um, so that's basically like, that's gonna be a fixed cost more or less for just opening and closing um, along with the cost of the actual data credits. Um, if, if you're not doing that much activity and if you wanna like save cost, you can keep those state channels open for, for quite a long time. Um, but that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, another expense of running a router is updating those filters because those filters are writing data to the blockchain and the bigger the filter and the more frequently you do that, the, the more you're going to spend. And, and it, as your filters grow, it, you might be paying um, a couple dollars worth of data credits to write those filters. But if you're just doing two or three devices, you're going to be looking at about 30 to 50 cents again. Um, and just so you know, in the environment router file end of router, um, there's a way to configure those filters to be automatically updated by router. So like as users on the console are adding devices, um, your router every 20 minutes, every, every day, whatever you configure it to, it might automatically, it, it would automatically update those filters for you. Um, on the other hand, what we're gonna do right now with Michael is we're just gonna literally, uh, we're gonna through a command line interface, tell router to just update the filter now on command. And by default, that's how it's configured because we don't want this thing just processing a bunch of transactions without you um, necessarily knowing about it. So uh, anyway, that's a bit of context there. Does that answer your question, Michael? Yeah, I think it does. Thanks. Cool. Um, so yeah, let's submit this guy. And, um, and then let's track that OUI purchase, actually. That's the big one. Oh. Cool. And let's scroll up and take the hash from the OUI purchase. Um, no, I, I think. Oh, is this cool. it? Yeah. OUI. Okay. So just one note what you'll see is the OUI index is four. Um, and so the transaction says four, but you're actually allocated OUI five. And so henceforth, when you're talking about your OUI, it's going to be five, even though this transaction comes in as four, um, normally. We submitted it at, uh, 
1913. So six and... minutes ago. Yeah, let's look at the blocks again, if you have that tab open. I think I closed it, but we can open it again. Cleared. And the other one? Uh, should clear, too. Still pending. Ah, that's OK. We can make progress. Um, cool. Well, congratulations. You're the owner of OUI5. And uh, since they're incrementally numbered, you, you'll get to like, like when people are OUI 20 and stuff, you'll just be like, I have five and you're 20. That's how cool I am. Um, so the last says four. That's now. you. Yep. Uh, by the way, uh, just a minor, I'm not a native English speaker, but we mean latest and not last, right? Ah, I, I don't know. I mean, that's the, one of the other biggest hardest things of computer science is <laughs> naming. Naming. Words yeah. are hard. Uh, no, it's, it's, I guess conceptually, like this is the last OUI that was purchased. Um, latest, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I, I like latest better too, but this is the way it is. And changing APIs is not that popular, so no. maybe we shouldn't do that. No, I agree. Right. So we Excellent. have another step, maybe. Yeah. Uh, so now we're going to. Uh, well, your your router should be a happy. Um, well, it'll have funds soon. Let's go ahead and write the. We're going to create the device that you're going to test with on. Um, on console. So by doing that, you'll you'll let console know that it exists. Um, and then um, you'll be able to tell router to update that filter. And uh, the filter will go to the blockchain and let the blockchain know that you own such a device. Um, yeah, so. Oh, so you did it already. I've already cried. I, I'm the TV chef. <laughs> cool. And just for yeah, for a little extra context, uh, you also have a helium hotspot um, easily within range of you. So, uh, but it, you don't have to. But as long as you're in range right now with the device you have in hand, um, the hotspots are all, go, all going to sync the blockchain, see that filter for that OUI, and they will um, they will know that this guy wants the packet. So let's go ahead and um, uh, let's. I guess we got to wait for that uh, data credit transaction to go through before we tell your router to update the filter. So let's check on that data credit transaction. Um, yeah. And also just one fun fact about filters. Uh, the way they're designed, um, you can't just look at the filters and extract the list of app EUIs and dev EUIs. Um, the, you actually have to put in the app EUI and dev EUI, and then it tells you whether that, that, um, whether that app EUI, dev EUI combo is in that table. So there's a little bit of a, um, uh, a privacy safeguard there um, in some way. You could try to brute force things. And that's why like, if you care about kind of concealing your, your devices, you want to you wanna pick those dev UIs and app UIs so that they're random. But generally those shouldn't be considered anything too secretive. Um, but there's a little bit of obfuscation, I guess is, is what I should say. So the token burn still pending. Yep. Oh, okay. Um, we're, yeah, we're having a, we're plagued with low block times today or high block times today. Yeah, we got that seven minute one, the two minute one. So this is a, the second burn Lewis is to, you want to just explain what now we're waiting for? Yeah. Uh, so the first burn was creating data credits in his, in, in Michael's main wallet, who's going to own the OUI. And that was so that he could make the OUI purchase. The second burn, he his uh, his main wallet is actually putting funds into the router um, account. Essentially, the the peer to peer address or the the key that's on router now has funds to to do its work with, and it needs those funds to do two things: uh, update filters and open and close state channels. And then after this, is he going to then need? He's going to need to. Uh, burn HNT for the specific organization of that device. Correct. No, I don't think that matters actually. Does it? Because uh, the organization that he created automatically has um, some free amount of data credits, I think. So he's got the 10,000 at the top there. So 
there's there there is a difference that's worth kind of discussing and thinking about is like um console is a product that's designed to manage lots of organizations with their own funding or their own balances um but that's all off chain so off chain we're in, in our postgres database that we're running locally we're crediting this this account with 10,000 dcs but that's kind of all irrelevant um if the blockchain account doesn't have the DCs. So that's why we're waiting for this burn to go through. And that's something for you to account for um, as, a, as an OUI operator or as, a, as a, someone operating console that you wanna um, make sure you have enough DCs laying around to cover those first 10,000 DCs for people. Um, make sure you have enough DCs laying around to cover the overhead of open and closing state channels. Um, and also uh, the, the updating of the filters as we talked about. So those are all kind of like the extra fees that um, generally, like when Helium operates at OUI uh, via our console, we cover those 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 details for you. And um, and as someone else running console, um, Michael's going to have to to manage those extra little costs that that come along with operating it. So we got a new block, but it was the transaction wasn't there either. Well, we could while resubmit we're, it. Uh, while we're waiting, could you just, uh, what happens if my router uh, goes offline for a while? I will, of course, not be able to purchase the messages that happened during that time. Yeah. Except that? Uh, that's the main problem. Um, your state channels that you left open, they, they might get garbage collected. Um, and so they'll get closed for you, more or less. Um, what else will happen? Yeah, basically, you you won't get the packets. Um, that's that's the worst thing that can. That, yep. that, that, there's nothing else that's really too big of a deal. Your router will will fall behind. It won't know about blocks that were made since it got shut down. So you'll want to kind of update this uh, via snapshot again, or give it time to sync up again. Um, but yeah, there's there's nothing too tragic that happens. Um, no, I'm thinking about how how much padding infrastructure I need around it, but then not really much. If and if it should crash, it will re, the Docker will restart, so I will yeah. not lose that much. So actually, we're not going to resubmit it because I remember now the um, that's part of what the API does is uh, since you see that it's there on pending transactions, um, if it gets like what could have happened is it the API tried to submit it and then it didn't get included and eventually got dropped by the consensus group, um, it's going to resubmit it automatically for you. Um, because it's, it's probably going to, at some point, the API says, like, this one's been pending for too long. Maybe the consensus group forgot about it. It's going to resubmit it on your behalf. So you don't have to really do anything. Um, and this generally doesn't happen. It's just, I think, the, the slow block times has probably uh, means that the transactions are also kind of getting lost here and there. OK, so your token burn went through. Uh, if you click that. Do you think You'll it's this one? Yeah, probably. Uh, let's see. It was DI. Yeah, it looks like the same hash. And then if you click the, pay, the payee, and that'll be the first transaction under your, uh, so your hot it has wallet. So bun, bunch of DC now. Yep. So it can do its work. So yeah, let's um, go ahead and uh, send it that command. So this Docker exec Helium router, router device XOR, um, and then with dash dash commit will, um, it's, it's a way to manually tell router to update the filter in the blockchain um, or the device table is another way of thinking about it. So now the blockchain and every hotspot that has a copy of it will know, um, that when your device is trying to join, that it wants to talk to your console or your OUI, um, essentially. And the uh, the router will do that update based on all the devices that it knows about, all the devices somebody has added. Yeah. So you can you can you could you could add twenty devices right now, and it'll do it'll like add that big it'll update the whole table. And because of the way the table is, um, if you if you basically if you add one device, you have to update the entire table. Yep. But um, we had, we didn't call this out specifically, but technically each OUI has five tables that it can manage. 
So there's different way, different algorithms for like how you touch those tables to perhaps minimize your transaction fees. Um, and so you might have one table that like once it gets to 100, let's say you stop updating it and you start a fresh table. And that way, um, the amount of data you're writing with every update is smaller. So um, those are some of the little nuances around the, those tables. And the, that's not a, at all related to the number of slabs that we bought? Completely unrelated. Because mm -hmm. um, basically what happens is like you put the app UI, dev UI into that table. Um, those are on the join frames. So when your device is trying to join the network, um, once that happens, your, uh, your network server, your console will allocate a dev adder from one of your slabs. It doesn't really matter which one. Or, um, and then your device will use that dev adder with the data frames. Um, so there's not really a connection. Um, or, you know, it, you could have five different tables. You could have, you could own two different slabs. The way you use them is pretty much arbitrary. All right. So should I run this without commit first? Yeah. Let's see what happens. I haven't um, I haven't used this command yet. So bummer. Look at the height. Um, let's do Docker exec helium router info height. Seven four five six two four. And where are we at? If you go to a which block was it's this transaction in? Seven, four, five, six, oh. six, eight. Jeez, you're so lagging. We're behind. Um, did you open up port two one five four yet? No. Oh, that so might be part of your issues. Why. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a general problem if you don't open that up. So um, let's open that up, and then maybe you can reconnect to my. Uh, to actually, I have a bunch of nodes I can give you addresses to. Um, because, yeah, what yeah. I bet is your peer book's probably not looking too good. All right. OK, so let's look at your uh, peer book with a uh, peer book dash s. OK. Yeah, what's going to be tough is you don't have a listen address. And um, basically, the. Uh, people will not be able to connect to you with, if you don't have a listen address. So until we resolve that, um, even if you do sync up your blockchain, we want to wait until you have a listen address so that the rest of the, the P2P network can find out how to connect to you. Because what happens is the hotspots receive the packet and they try to find you and they try to connect to you to sell you the packet. And so if, they, if you don't have a listen address, they can't connect to you. Hey, um, you're syncing have... stuff though, and that's cool. Yeah, that's a block. Um, and I think there's an invalid thing because uh, you probably tried to, you, you had a block that was a kind of ahead of where you were already. 624, okay, we haven't, we haven't absorbed anything yet. It basically receives the blocks and sometimes out of order tries to apply them. Um, so it's not too worrisome when it says this kind of stuff. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we're all synced up now. Let's try this um, updating the device filter again. Um, and this command should work because now your router knows about your balance, essentially. Yeah. We got a different error. Let's change your XOR filter worker and set it to true. And then that way, even if this command is broken, within 10 minutes, um, router will update it anyway. OK, so. And it's going to reload that environment? No. Yeah, no. Let's, let's do a restart. So I just control C in this window, right? Yep. Let's look on Explorer to see whether your, uh, your router might have gotten busy already. It might have tried to open a state channel. OK. Um, uh... Do you have your router address handy? So this is what we're looking for, right? Yes, except we're missing the uh, the last couple characters, unfortunately. It's also, yeah. it should be close to your wallet too, if you have the wallet window open still. Uh, but we have it. Oh, there you go. Uh, yep, sorry. So let's just keep this open because it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what activity gets through. 
Um, yep. Are you able to start up the Docker Compose again? Yeah. And if you want, because I don't know what, I think um, Explorer does not show the filter update transactions. Okay. So uh, I think what you should do is fire up your device and get it stuck in a, or let it try its, oh wait, hold on, look at this. New filter submitted. All right. Okay. So. The command didn't work for now, but it looks like you're uh, the auto you're, you're doing a lot working. of stuff here now. If you look, you've <laughs> you submitted a new filter and you open two state channels. Um, so state channels are uh, actually let me give the marker again. Um, okay, so you have a lot of good traffic here. It looks like you um, you submitted your XOR filter, and you've opened two state channels. Um, the state channels are important because um, you open two of them because you always want to keep one open. So one will be your primary one that you're doing the traffic in. And then when that is done, you'll close it, but you'll have the other one still open so that you're always uh, able to purchase packets, basically. Um, so it looks like those are both submitting the start state channel openings. Um, what we're going to want to do is uh, keep looking for a new block to get synced down. Um, and eventually, uh, once those two transact or those three transactions, your XOR filter and your state channels um, are processed, then you're pretty much ready for business. Um, the blockchain knows about your device that you put into console earlier, and you have state channels so people can transact with you. Um, and actually, uh, with your browser window on the right here, um, we will definitely see those state channels open up when they get processed as well. Um, yeah, it looks like you probably resubmitted the transaction. Um, and we just got to wait for a block to come in again. So you got your routing table updated with that routing v1. Your state channel was opened. And so you're basically ready to do business on the blockchain now. Um, the uh, hotspots are going to um, see both of these transactions and know that you want that join packet from your device. And they can know that they can also do transactions with you in that state channel. So uh, let's go to console and look at that device. And then if you can power it up, um, we, uh, we can kind of see that first packet come in. Um, yeah. So I that super device. Nice. Yeah, I've added my device, but it's never communicated on my LoRaWAN network. Uh, so you mean on your have... LoRaWAN network server? Yeah. So uh, on the people's this network. This is my <laughs> test device. It's a bit bare metal, but it works. So I'll just connect it. And why don't you click on the device actually on console cuz I think that'll give you a live feed of packets and uh, with some luck, we'll see the, the join request come in soon. Okay, so I sent the join request out and I got an accept. Yeah, we have the data here. Hey, uh, look at that. But... What's the matter? Wait, uh, no, there's no data. Oh, there. Oh, there it is. There it yeah. is. Nice. Cool. Oh. So things to like note is that dev address has got to be within your slab. Um, and uh, yeah, but you basically, I, I think what's really kind of cool to think about is the idea that this is hitting my hotspot right here. Um, it's checking the blockchain and then giving it to your router that you just set up wherever. And there's pretty much nobody kind of getting in the way of that. Um, and it's completely decentralized at this point. So I think that's pretty neat. Cool. So yeah, I guess what we started with was we put up that uh, 
the router or um, we put up the open source console um, system, which is a, uh, includes router and the Postgres database and then the console front end that we're looking at on the right here. Um, and on the left, uh, you can kind of see some of the, um, the traces from router and console as they're being offered packets from my device over here in the US um, that's uh, sending packets, my hotspot's selling it to the router that um, Michael's operating. And that router is the operator of the OUI number five, which Michael bought um, earlier as well. So um, yeah, that's kind of the, the short of everything that we set up today, which is uh, pretty much the whole stack basically. And yeah, so what's, what's, um, what you'll see later here is uh, that state channel will eventually close. And um, in that state channel traffic, um, you will see the name of my hotspot uh, as somebody that you're burning DCs for. So if you look back on console, um, you'll see the name of the hotspot that I'm operating here. Um, I don't even think it's on the chain. It's just a one I, I use here for testing. Um, yep. The Jolly Carbon Hedgehog uh, is, um, you'll burn the DCs for me, but I won't earn anything, but the DCs will be used. So uh, it, you can expect that um, when you look at that closed channel later. Michael, thank you very much. And congratulations on being the official first person to set up a, your own open source console. Uh, it's in the blockchain now, so it's, it'll be there forever. Um, so, and, and thank you very much for your time, uh, kind of walking through this with us. Um, really appreciate it. And, you know, for people who uh, are doing this and, and they experience issues, please, you know, report. It's not going to be perfect. Um, and we're always going to continue to improve. So please provide your feedback um, so we can continue to get better. And then Lewis, Michael, did you guys have any closing things before? I know it's been a long, long session. So uh, any closing remarks you guys wanted to uh, say before we signed off? Nothing on my end. Um, I was thinking though, this the, the OUI that Michael has, it's kind of like a, an NFT, isn't it? A non-fungible token almost. It's a, it's a, as, it's a unique asset that he, um, that he owns. Yeah. And uh... I'm going to cherish it for my whole life. <laughs> I should I should probably print out the block on paper yeah. and get it framed. Block 748532 or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you, right. Louis and all. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, have a good day. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Louis.